Hi, welcome to study tips from a professor that wants you to learn faster, better, smarter, with less effort. Uh, today we're going to revisit the Feynman technique. We looked at this before, but I had a few questions today in my class and it got me thinking on the Feynman technique and I thought it's, it's definitely timely to revisit the Feynman technique. And also, I just happened to pull up on my cell phone an article by Shane Paris and Farnham Street, and it reminded me of uh, this story here, Charlie Munger and the fictitious chauffeur of Max Planck story. Very interesting uh, story. Uh, you can find more information at that link there. I'll try to provide the link below in the description as well. But basically it outlines that Max Planck, who's a Nobel laureate back in the early 1900s, a good friend of Einstein's, uh, was traveling Europe and doing a lot of lectures. And of course it's a little bit of a fictitious story, uh, but it, it really sort of hits home. And so he was doing all these lectures, and reminds me of some of the lectures I do sometimes, and you repeat yourself so many times, and the chauffeur was kind of getting bored of driving him all over Europe doing this lecture, but he was always listening to the lecture, and he had it completely memorized. And he said to Max Planck, he said, do you mind if I actually do the lecture today? I have it memorized, it shouldn't be a problem. And so he's giving the lecture, and there's a professor in the audience that asks, uh, ghastly question is the way it's it's phrased but basically a complex question the chauffeur you know is pretty quick-witted says uh, to the professor in the audience that's asking the question my what a ghastly question it's so simple I would have thought somebody from Munich would have been able to ask a more complicated question for the answer to this question I'm going to refer it to my chauffeur who happened to be Max Planck that was standing in the audience and was able to easily answer the question. And I think what that question really sort of hits home about, as the Albert Einstein quote below says, any fool can know the point is to understand. And so there is a difference between knowing something, like memorizing something, and really understanding something. So as the, the first bullet says, there's a difference between knowing the name of something and really knowing something. You know, we can memorize a lot of things and look like we're fairly smart, but actually knowing it is helpful uh, in a lot of ways. And so that kind of made me think uh, during my lecture today a little bit about that. And for those of you that don't know Feynman, uh, it got into a lot more prominence recently with Oppenheimer the movie. Uh, although he didn't really have a name or a big part in the movie, they had him sort of standing there with the big hair beside Oppenheimer in the actual uh, movie because he was very young uh, when he was on the Manhattan Project. But nevertheless, a uh, very, very smart uh, physicist. And not only that, had a way of explaining things in simple terms that made it more easy to understand something. And I think I try to do that in my own teaching where I try to take something that's fairly complicated and figure out ways that I can make it simpler. And also even in my own learning, I recognize that there's some things, you know, I've kind of memorized, but I really, uh, really don't know it. Uh, and so that kind of frustrates me sometimes. And I have to, if I want to really, really get into the weeds about it, see if I can simplify it and uh, come to really understand it without just memorizing something. Um, so what are the tips uh, to the Feyn te te uh, Feynman technique. Well, you know, if you're trying to learn something, you could suggest, I, I would suggest identifying something that maybe you struggle with a bit. Uh, maybe the teacher explained it, but it's just not clicking with you. You know, there's stuff that actually the teacher explains or you, you actually get it fairly quick, but then there's the stuff that you don't. And so what we try to do often is just try to get by with it. But often as you advance in your careers and knowledge base, it may be oh, something that's preventing you from truly understanding something bigger later on. Um, so if you think of it that way and then you think of it as a fundamental to your progression, then maybe that's something you want to try to get a better understanding of. And I noticed today when I was doing my uh, stair calculations in the class, and I was kind of compressed for time a little bit, but you know, what's a 
comfortable rise and run for a stairs. Of course, I'm a professor of construction management, so that's kind of, you know, the stuff that we kind of talk about as an example. And, you know, there's, there's stairs that people climb that are not comfortable, and then there's stairs that people climb that are comfortable. And what's, what's kind of the difference? And there's comfortable rise and run for a stairs, and it can be uh, at a certain point and what what they found is that around seven inches and ten inches or 180 and 250 unit rise and unit run is a very comfortable stairs but of course if we're looking at stairs and stair construction you're never going to get it exactly at seven inches because usually from one floor to the next it's not going to easily divide into seven inches or it's not going to easily divide into 180 but if you can get it close to that and if say 7 and 10 is my example they find that the combination of 7 and 10 adding up to 17 makes for a comfortable stairs so the, the adding the unit rise and uh, unit run adding to 17 makes for a comfortable stairs so say your it divides evenly at six and a half inches well if you make your run ten and a half six and a half plus ten and a half that adds to 17 well why is that well then that's that's the difference between memorizing, okay, so 7 and 10 has the plus 17, uh, that gives a comfortable stairs. But why is that? Well, if you've got a lower unit rise, then you're raising your foot less. If you're raising your foot less, it's kind of closer to a walk. So you can stretch it out a little bit more. It's closer to walking. If it's a higher step, well, then you don't want to reach it out. It's more like climbing a ladder, which is steeper. And so the comfort level in that zone, you can make it a little bit longer if it's a little bit lower rise. If it's a little bit higher rise, you make it a little bit shorter so that basically it's a more comfortable step when you're going up. And of course, building codes have maximums and minimums and that usually has ties to, especially on the, on the unit rise, ties to the elderly who have trouble lifting their, their feet up uh, any more than say uh, building code like for us is seven and seven inch inches or 200 millimeters uh, or kids, little kids. It's a little bit harder for them to reach up that way. So we have building codes that restrict things, but then there's what's more comfortable. And so you try to put it into a, a framework like that, that people can understand why it is, because you could easily teach it seven plus 10 is 17. And they memorize it and they do okay on a test but understanding that that really sort of hits home the other thing in the same sort of uh, jest that i was going over today was looking at a stairwell opening well and i'm not going to go into everything here i've got that in other videos on on my playlist you know where i go into stair construction and things like that and you can check out my residential construction playlist for that but essentially i don't know what size stairwell opening I should make. I maybe know what headroom I want. You know, this is a building code requirement here. That could be six foot eight if we're talking about imperial uh, or six foot nine, whatever your building code requirements are. I need to know what's the thickness of my floor. My finished floor with my drywall on, is it 300 millimeters or is it 12 inches as an example? And then what I need to do is figure out my unit rise and unit run. So is it six and a half and 10 and a half? Is it 186 by 244? Because I've, I've calculated that for the most comfortable run. And if I know that and I've worked that out, then basically I just have to know similar triangles. Visualize, okay, well, I've got a big triangle here and it's got this slope on it. And that's based on the slope of my 186 by 244 that that's forming. So I've got similar triangles. So I can flip this triangle upside down. And so this is just basically proportional to what this side of the triangle is and then this side. And of course, this side of the triangle is my 1950 plus 300 that I was saying over here. I've just made like a, a side of a triangle. And so basically I'm solving for an unknown. I could just say there's this formula that you plug the numbers in and you could come up with the right answer. But this way, you don't need to know the formula. You can always just look at it and figure it out. So basically 186 is, is to 244 as 2250 is to X. And then we just solve for X. And then that will give us 2952 for our opening. 
So that's the difference between, uh, you know, memorizing something and understanding something. Now, I don't expect that you would get all of that in this short period of time, but when I do a teach a class in this, you know, years ago when I started teaching, I kind of like had that formula memorized, but that's not really helping. It's better if you kind of understand basic math principles and then similar triangle principles, and then you can solve it on your own without a formula because you can create it just looking at it for what makes sense to you. That's really helpful. And that's just on a simple example. So using the Feynman technique is really sort of trying to figure out, well, you know, first you have to really study it. And I had to do that beyond my early explanations when I was teaching. And that might mean re doing some background research. You know, chat GPT today, there's stuff there that you can ask for you know, how would I explain this in more simple terms? It can actually help you that way, ChatGPT. Um, check out some YouTube videos where you've got some explanations on that. Uh, review your textbook and notes. Nobody ever takes notes in class anymore, and this is on the next slide. Talk to your peers about it. Uh, you know, what are you understanding about this? And so, yeah, I find that people don't really take notes anymore, but there's something about writing something down that helps you to remember it or drawing a little drawing about it and labeling it that helps you to remember it. And if you get stuck, you know, go back and see, okay, I'm stuck on this and try to find out what's the answer to this particular thing. Now, this is where it gets really good is, you know, then the next step is taking this and then pretending you're teaching this to somebody in the sixth grade. So you're really sort of stripping it down and trying to simplify your explanation, right? How do I make this more simple to understand? And so like my example with the steps, like I'm just, it's, it's more closer to walking because this is lower and that's a little bit longer, then that can make, that can really sort of induce some understanding. Oh, well, that makes sense. What would be comfortable with the stairs? I get that. And then notice some stairs that you're walking on. Like in our college, we have one step that's fairly low rise and a long unit run. And people get that that's more like a walk up that stairs than it is where one is a little bit higher and shorter, where it's a little bit more of a, a rise up and why you don't need it so long. Um, so that's, that's helpful when you can try to put things into terms that people understand and you explain it in a much uh, easier format. So you're really trying to repeat that in a way that's more understandable and easy for people to get. Very important from that perspective of simplifying it and that people actually understand it. So Feynman always had this first principle, which is that uh, you must not fool yourself and uh, really that you really know something uh, you're the easiest person to fool when it comes to you right like because sometimes you just think like yeah, I know this it is not try can you explain this in simple terms if somebody like uh, in that uh, you know fictitious example that I gave with uh, Max Planck that Charlie Munger usually brings up that uh, from Warren Buffett uh, can you really sort of now explain or answer that question? Because if you can, maybe you don't really understand it as well as you need to or you should, especially if this is something that is going to be part of your profession or something that you do on an ongoing basis. And once you really kind of get it, then it's easy because you don't, you're not memorize those things. It's just like, okay, I can draw this out. I can figure this out. I can uh, lay this out and I get it. Uh, it's very helpful. So I would suggest using the Feynman technique, if you're struggling in those types of areas to your benefit, use it as a tool to improve your learning. There's a lot of tools in the toolkit that we add and the Feynman technique is definitely a helpful tool in that area. So I hope this has been helpful for you. If you've enjoyed it or you want more videos in this particular area, please click on my, uh, sub click subscribe, click on the playlist and you can get further and comment if there's anything that examples where you see the Feynman technique working for you. So I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.